following program is made possible by the friends and partners of Andrew Womack Ministries. Thank you for changing the world. Welcome to Gospel Truth with Andrew Womack, a teaching ministry that focuses on God's unconditional love and grace. And now, here's Andrew. Welcome to our Tuesday's broadcast of the Gospel Truth. Today is the end of my first week of teaching on a subject that I've entitled, The War is Over. And I tell you, I'm really excited about this. I believe people are going to get hold of the goodness of God and how much He loves them through this teaching as much as anything that I've ever taught. Also, we have brand new products out on this. We not only have our CD album that covers this, but I have a book and also a workbook. And this is our study guide. As you can tell, this is a very thick study guide. And this is the book. We also have this in Spanish. And uh, my staff was in here coaching me on how to pronounce the war is over in Spanish. But you know what? I, I decided that I think I'll not try and pronounce it. I can, I can barely speak English. But we do have it translated into Spanish. And I am really excited about this teaching. This workbook is designed specifically to help you teach a Bible study or a Sunday school class. There's a CD-ROM in the front of it where you can actually reproduce that book as many times as you want. And the idea is that when you have a lesson, you just print out as many lessons as you need so that everybody can have this copy right in front of them. And so it's a great study tool. And I believe that this topic of the war is over is going to really impact your life. This week I've been sharing from Luke 2, 14, that when the angels sang glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill towards men, that wasn't talking about peace among men, but rather peace from God towards men. The angels were declaring the end of the war, the end of hostilities between God and man. Man, that's powerful. I shared some verses out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5 where it says that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself. The word reconcile means to make friendly or to bring into harmony. And the way he did that was by not imputing men's trespasses unto them. And I was talking about how that all of our sins were imputed unto Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5, 21, For he, God the Father, made him, Jesus who knew no sin, to be made sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in Him. God placed all of our sin upon Jesus and because of that, now a holy God can fellowship with unholy men because the war is over. The wrath has been uh, appeased. The price has been paid through Jesus. I took Isaiah chapter 40 and talked about how that there was twice as much payment for sin as what was necessary. Jesus overpaid our debt. And the point that I'm trying to get across is most people think, yes, Jesus is absolutely essential, but I also have to suffer for my own sins in some way. Suffer by not getting my prayers answered. Suffer with a sin consciousness. Suffer a feeling of unworthiness. But no, Jesus paid it all. And then the, on yesterday's program, I used Isaiah 52, 14, where it says that Jesus' face was marred more than any man's face that has ever lived. And his form, talking about his bodily shape, was so marred that he didn't even look human. And what I'm trying to do by all of these scriptures is to just increase what you understand Jesus paid for your sins. Increase the value that you place on that. And by doing so, what that does, it overwhelms a person's sense of unworthiness. It's not to say that we aren't unworthy. I'm not trying to diminish any person's awareness of how much we've sinned. I'm just trying to increase their awareness of how much was paid for your sins and it's like a tidal wave in comparison. God's payment more than compensated for whatever your sins are. You know, I'm sure that you've either said this or had somebody say this to you. I've had it said to me many, many times. Somebody will come up and say, I know Jesus died for my sins, but you just don't understand what I've done. And what they're doing in a sense, if you were to take Jesus' atonement and their sin and hold them together, they're saying, in a sense, my sin is heavier than Jesus' atonement. That's just not so. 
What Jesus paid is more, much, much more than what your sin deserved. And so for any person to say, but you just don't know what I've done. How could God ever love me? You need to have more value, more worth placed on the sacrifice of Jesus. And that's what we're doing. Let me continue on in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 1. It's still talking about Jesus and how that he was so marred that he didn't look human. In chapter 53, verse 1, Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, Isaiah just continues on and begins to once again start talking about the price that Jesus was going to pay uh, for our sins. But in the middle of all of these statements, he had just made the statement about his face was marred more than any man, his form more than the sons of man. And he comes right here and he says, Who hath believed our report? To whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? You know what I believe this is? Is basically Isaiah was overwhelmed thinking about that the Messiah is going to be brutalized, marred so that he's not even recognizable as human. And, and in the middle of this, and he goes on and makes these other statements about he, how he bore our sorrows and carried our griefs. In the middle of it, he just, like, how can you believe this? How can a person believe this? How can we understand that God Almighty would come down here and operate the way that he did? You know, if us, if we were in God's place, and if we would have come to the earth, we would have come with trumpets blowing, we would have come with fanfare, we would have announced ourselves to the Caesar of the day, we would have come in some demonstration of our glory and power. Jesus came humbly. He humbled himself. He didn't promote himself. And instead of coming down here and just destroying the enemies and waging war and him coming out the conquering king, Jesus, it looked like, was overcome by the very one that he came to destroy. Everything seems to be different than the way that we would have done it. And this is what uh, Isaiah is making reference to. is like, who, who can believe this? How could these things be? And then he goes on to say in verse 2, For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. The word comeliness here is talking about beauty. That's what that word means. Jesus wasn't a pretty person. And it says, and when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. You know, again, if we were God and if we were going to become in the likeness of man, if we were going to become a man, you know, I hate to say this, but this is probably the way it would have been. I've just got enough carnality in me that this is probably the way it would have been, that if I'd have been God wanting to become a man, I'd have been the biggest, strongest, I'd have made all of these bodybuilders and weightlifter guys look pathetic in comparison. <laughs> I'd have been taller. I'd have been a handsome guy. I'd have done all of these things. That's the way most of us would do it. But God came in a form that there wasn't any beauty. There was nothing in Jesus' physical body to desire him. You know, I've not read this book. I'm not going to mention the name of it, but there's a book out now that is very popular, and the guy is talking to a person who is representing Jesus, and he's in a human form. And anyway, as they're carrying on this conversation, the, the guy is just shocked, saying, I expected, and he, he fumbled for words, and, and uh, Jesus in this book says, you expected somebody that looked better or nicer than I did, and and anyway, they carry on this conversation, and they portray Jesus as just a very common, ordinary-looking person. Did you know I believe that that is exactly the way that his physical body was? This is what these verses are saying. And again, this is just so amazing that Almighty God would humble himself and become a man. But then, if you did do that, it's amazing that he didn't come as the finest specimen of human flesh that ever walked on the face of the earth. Instead, he came in a way that there was no beauty and nothing in him that we should desire him. You know what I'm doing through saying this and reading these scriptures is showing you that as, as, as uh, major as the crucifixion of Jesus was, that's not all the price that he paid. Jesus lived for 33 years in a body that wasn't as nice and pretty as somebody else's body that he created. He could have created a better body, but you know what? He came in a form where he knows what it's like to be left passed over. He knows what it's like to be ignored. 
You know, Jesus created all of these people. He was their creator, and yet for 30 years he walked around and would see people, and they just would ignore him. They didn't see any difference between him and anybody else. They'd walk right by him. Part of why Jesus suffered was just being ignored, looked over. Have any of you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, man, God, I'm just nobody special? There's nothing special in my life. You know what? Jesus was there. Jesus didn't just suffer on the cross. I'm not minimizing that at all. But Jesus suffered by becoming a man. He at one time, the heavens of the heavens could not contain him is what the scripture says. It says that he can hold the universe in the span of his hand. The span is talking about the width of your hand right here. He can put the entire universe in the span of his hand. And yet he became limited to a physical human body. That's just mind boggling. Imagine what it was like for Almighty God to be confined to a physical body, to have to walk from place to place. Jesus, you know, we don't know for sure, but he probably never went over 100 or 200 miles from his hometown. And yet here's the one who created the universe, and he's limited to time and space. He was ignored by people. There was nothing beautiful in him. He saw other people who were being ooed and gnawed at and people talking about how handsome they were. And here he was, the creator. Nobody ever said that about him. Look at this in verse 3. It says, He is despised and rejected of man, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. You know, this is a major point right here. It says that he was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief, but this wasn't because of his grief. He didn't do something that caused him grief. He hadn't done things that caused him shame. He bore our grief, carried our sorrows. He bore our shame. And here is a major point for me, and I get in trouble a lot. People say that I'm insensitive and that you aren't compassionate towards people. You don't sit there and feel their pain. Jesus felt your pain. Jesus bore your sorrows. Jesus carried your grief. And I have compassion for people that aren't appropriating that, but I, I guarantee you I don't understand it, and I am not sympathetic towards it. If Jesus bore my grief and carried my sorrow, I'm not going to bear it, and there's no reason for you to bear it. And again, the church as a whole approaches this differently. They come at it as, oh, you really had a hard time. I had a guy one time at one of our minister's conference, and he and his wife had been hurt. Everybody gets hurt. I understand. He had some bad things happen to him, and he came to our minister's conference, and he was sitting there with tears in his eyes, and I mean his whole face was droopy. He just <laughs> looked miserable. Uh, you didn't have to have a gift of the Holy Spirit to know that he, this guy was struggling. And anyway, he came up for prayer, and one of the ministers at the conference walked up, and he says, Don't feel bad, my little children. If I wasn't God, I'd be discouraged too. And of course, he was just joking. And I thought it was, I thought it was hilarious. But this guy didn't think it was hilarious. Man, he, he didn't take that well at all. He got upset over it. But that's the way that most people want you to. They want you to feel like, oh, even God must be struggling. God must be really hurt over what's happened to you. No, Jesus bore your sorrows and carried your grief. He suffered more than you have ever suffered. And if Jesus suffered for you, then th I am not going to suffer too. That's double jeopardy. Why? I, there is nothing to gain. There is nothing for me to gain. If Jesus has already borne my sorrows and carried my griefs, if he did all of this for me, he didn't have his own griefs and sorrows, he took mine so that I wouldn't have to bear them. And so you know what? I am pretty adamant about walking in joy and victory. I don't care what's going on. Have you lost somebody? Did your mate die? I understand that that's tough, and I understand that the Holy Spirit will minister to you, but you shouldn't grieve the way that other people grieve because God took your grief and bore your sorrows. You don't have to fall apart like a $2 suitcase. I understand if you do. I'm not condemning you if you do, but I'm saying it's absolutely unnecessary. You can draw on the power of God, and you can be victorious over that. As the doctor told you you're going to die, you don't have to grieve over it. Jesus bore your sorrows and carried your grief. Has your business failed? Has your marriage failed? 
has something else failed, you can still rejoice. You can bless the Lord at all times, is what David said. I really believe that. And see, some people, again, it, it's the same principle that I'm talking about. They just don't understand how much Jesus paid. And so they think, oh, yes, I'm not going to grieve as much as maybe somebody else, but, oh, I've, I've been carrying this heavy burden for all of these years. You don't have to do that. Jesus said, my burden is easy. My yoke is easy and my burden is light out of Matthew chapter 11. Jesus bore your grief and carried your sorrow. You do not have to live that way. And when a person is saying, well, you know, you're just making it sound like that we should live an absolutely victorious life regardless of what happened. Yep, that's exactly what I'm saying, amen. I'm not critical of people who don't because I understand it, but I'm saying that that is available and I am putting worth on what Jesus has done and to the best of my ability, I'm walking in victory. I haven't arrived, but I've left and I am succeeding in areas that I can guarantee I would have crumbled under before, but it's because I have put value. I've recognized that Jesus did this for me. I don't have to suffer. I don't have to go through all these things. I will have problems come, but I don't have to let those problems get down on the inside of me. He bore my sorrows and carried my griefs. It says in verse 5, but he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. If my peace, if he, he, if he struggled so that I could have peace, well then praise God, I'm honoring him to have peace. It's not honoring him to be grief stricken and bowed over so that I look miserable and I can't uh, rejoice because the pressures of life have just beat me up. Again, I know that there's religious systems that teach, no, you have to suffer and that, you know, you just need to get down there and when a person is miserable, you just need to get down and pat them on the back and say, don't feel bad. If God wasn't God, he'd be discouraged too. That's not so. Jesus came here and paid this and my, my burden for all of these things has already been born and praise God, I can reap this. And of course, by his stripes, we are healed. I could preach, I have preached for weeks, for months on healing, physical healing, emotional healing. It includes all of those things. In verse 7, it says, He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter and as a sheep before his shearers is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. Again, this is part of the suffering of Jesus. It wasn't just the physical beating, but it was the fact that here is the Creator standing in front of his creation. And Herod and Pilate mocked him and says, don't you know that I have power to crucify you? And he says, you don't have any power over me. He says, the person that delivered me to you has got the greater sin. Jesus could have justified himself. This was his creation. He could have struck them all dead. As the saying goes, he could have called 10,000 angels. And yet he humbled himself and became obedient. He was like a sheep before his shears. He didn't open his mouth. He didn't say anything. And they marveled. Pilate says, don't you understand that I have power to do all this? Aren't you going to say anything? You know, Jesus suffered a lot more than just the physical suffering. And again, I'm not trying to diminish that. But what I am trying to show you is that Jesus lived in a body that wasn't a special body. It wasn't the most beautiful body. It wasn't the greatest specimen of human flesh that had ever walked on the earth. It was so normal that nobody desired him. Nobody wanted to be like Jesus in his physical body. He was passed over. He was ignored. All of these things happened, and yet Jesus suffered all of these things. I don't know about you, but see, this really, to me, touches me to realize that Jesus didn't just suffer for just a, you know, a, a day's period of time when he was being interrogated and, and crucified. As bad as all of that was, and I don't diminish that at all, Jesus suffered the entire 33 years that he walked on this earth. And he allowed people to treat him as if he was just common like everybody else. I tell you, most of us in a situation like that, being passed over, persecuted, rejected, ignored, all of these things, we would have done something to manifest ourselves, to make people see who we are. And yet Jesus bore all of this just for us. 
it says in verse 8, He was taken from prison and from judgment. And who shall declare his generation? Contrary to the book, the Da Vinci Code, this says that he didn't have a generation. That means he didn't have any descendants. That's all lies. That's all stuff to undermine the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all absolute nonsense. It says, he, Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. You know, he was crucified between two thieves. He was buried in a rich man's tomb. Jesus was accounted, you know, as a criminal, a common criminal, the creator of everyone. The pure, holy Son of God was totally rejected. You know, I pray that this is just amplifying what Jesus has done, making it more real. What Jesus paid was more than what was demanded. That's a powerful statement. In verse 10, Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When he shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. In Galatians chapter 3, that's talking about us. We are the seed, the spiritual offsprings. He shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Notice it says it pleased the Lord to bruise him. I don't believe it pleased the Lord in the sense that he enjoyed it, but it was, it was the way, it was the only way that this war between God and man could end. And the Lord was so touched with his love for us that it actually was to his, it, it suited his goal. It was his will that his son suffer so that you and I wouldn't have to suffer. God placed his wrath upon his son and did all of these things so that you and I could be free from sin. And it's a shame that so many people aren't receiving the benefit. There has been such a huge price paid that there is no reason for us to still be feeling hostility and anger from God towards us. We need to recognize that the price has been paid, that the war is over. I tell you, that is a powerful, powerful truth. And that's what these verses are saying. It pleased the Lord. And notice this. It says in verse 11, He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. When Jesus suffered for my sin and for your sin, that satisfied the demands of God. Not what you do. It's not your penance. It's not your groveling in the dirt. It's not your living a life feeling that you're unworthy and somehow or another doing penance for the rest of your life. That's not what satisfies God. He saw the travail of his soul and was satisfied. That's what satisfies God. I'm not saying that you shouldn't repent of sin, but I'm saying that it is not you and what you do that has satisfied the demands of God. It's what Jesus did for you. And the price that he paid was double what was due. Therefore, you don't have to go about bearing any sin consciousness. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 2. And I'm going to continue to talk about this and amplify on this and share some things with you that I guarantee is going to transform your life. Andrew's complete teaching series titled, The War Is Over, is available on either CD or on DVD as seen on our daily TV program. Each is offered for 16 pounds. Remember to specify the CD or DVD when you order. This series is also available for audio download absolutely free on our website. Go to awme.net. After choosing English, click on Resources at the top of the page and then MP3 Downloads. If you prefer, the War Is Over series is available in book form when you send £8.50. A Spanish version is also available. You can also get this teaching in a companion study guide for £17.50 when you contact the ministry. The first audio teaching in today's series is available for £3 when you write or call. But if you're simply unable to afford it, Andrew and his partners will send this first CD titled Peace and Goodwill Free of Charge. We'd like to remind you that we're offering Andrew's latest book titled Effortless Change for £8.50. 
Contact us today to get your copy. You can use your credit card to order resources by telephone. Our helpline number is 01922 473 300. When calling from outside the UK, you must dial your international calling code, then 44 1922 473 300. Helpline hours are from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Greenwich Mean Time. Or you can visit our website where you can order ministry materials 24 hours a day, seven days a week at awme.net. To write us, use the address on your screen. I know that many of you are hearing truths that is just setting you free. And you say, man, this is good, but I need so much more. You know, we have our website, we have a lot of different things, but really the most in-depth way that we have of sharing these truths with you is through our Karis Bible Colleges. We not only have the Bible College here in Colorado Springs, but we have different Bible Colleges spread throughout the world. We have nearly, uh, I think it's 400, close to 400 people that are taking the Bible co College by correspondence course. There's a lot of ways that you can take advantage of this. So we've got a number on your screen. If you would call that number, you can ask and people will inform you or send you a brochure about our Karis Bible Colleges. Have you ever wanted to check out back issues of Gospel Truth Magazine from Andrew Womack Ministries? They're available online at awmi.net. Just log on to our website, look to the left, and click on Extras. Then look to the left again and click on Online Magazines. Once you're there, you're free to browse through our selection of Gospel Truth Magazines from years past. Check out some great articles and be sure and check out the current issue while you're at it. Gospel Truth Magazine, now available online at awmi.net. I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis more than 20 years ago. I had control of nothing. My arms, my legs, I had no control. Each day I felt like I could wake up and my mom would be gone. It was really hard for me. I began to feel uh, helpless. The frustration of not being able to fix something when you're a fix-it guy. Andrew put it so clearly. That's what freed me. The more I applied the word, then the healing, healing will come. The healing will come just gradually, gradually. And that was okay for me because I knew that I was healed. For a complete report on this story, go to awmi.net and click on today's news feature. Invest yourself in Andrew Womack Ministries today.